to be one with me. I still talk to him about that one a bit. I kind of go, this is a bit strange, God. That you would be one with me. Because, you know, I, you, you are so awesome and so powerful and no one can contain you or limit you or control you in any way, shape or form and then you said that you would be one with me. But I feel actually contained and limited and restricted and, and in, in, in limited space and time and energy and all sorts of things and, and I'm one with you. Still learning how to walk that one out. But, you know, that's, that's what the spiritual disciplines are all about. And that's what I, I've been enjoying a book, and you'll see many quotes from this book because it's just full of good quotes. And um, by, by um, Richard Foster called The Celebration of Discipline. Now, I know some people are prolific readers, and they read huge amounts of stuff. Well, actually, I'm, I'm a math science guy. Reading has always been painful to me. So, so when I talk to God about stuff, say, God, if you want me to read a book, you better make sure that it's the one that I should be reading because this has got to be a process. It's got to take me some time. Because some people can just read lots and lots and lots of books, right? And they pick out good bits out of all that. And that's great. I'm not <laughs> that's a fantastic gift. But it's not me. And that's okay. I enjoy reading. I just haven't got as much time as others to do it. So this particular book is for me. But then God has said, it's not just for you, Kim. It's for us. Because he talked to me a few years back now, and I've told you this many times, gave me two words, obedience and discipline. Obedience and discipline. And now I think for the next little period of time, we're going to spend a little bit of time on that word discipline. But in particular, spiritual disciplines. Not just human disciplines. Let's go to the first slide. There's a quote up there from Richard Foster. Superficiality is the curse of our age. Now this book was written in about 1979. So it's not totally disconnected from our current culture, but our culture has moved on significantly from there. Superficiality is the curse of our age. The doctrine of instant satisfaction is our primary spiritual problem. I think we have probably amplified that as we've gotten in the last 20, 30 years. The desperate need today is not for a greater number of intelligent people or gifted people, but for deep people. You know, it, it reminds me of a story of a gentleman in Africa, and I heard it was, I was playing with mum and dad, dad on his piano accordion, and mum singing, I, I was on the piano, at a full gospel businessman's meeting, and this, this, this probably in his mid-30s, 40s, African gentleman was speaking, and he spoke about another African gentleman who was in Africa, who was probably in his 40s or 50s, who was so poor that he couldn't even, his, his coat was all he had to, in the mornings, he'd use his coat to dry his children after they'd had their showers. Then he'd put his coat on and go to work. But before he went to work, he would do an open air, um, uh, just seminar type thing, at preaching in the park. And then on his way home from work, he'd go back to the park and preach again. Now, this gentleman had to speak in three different languages to get his sermon across because he wasn't very good at language. He wasn't very educated. But this gentleman, this, this younger African guy that was speaking to us said he had to learn from this man because this man would have literally thousands of people in the park. And there was one story that I remember quite well where he, sa where the, he said, Jesus is going to come and visit us. And he said to the guys who were way across, it was like in a, in a city, and across the road there was a big double freeway and across the road there was, um, there was people in trees listening to him and there was cafeteria. And he said, get out of the trees. He said to them, get out of the trees because Jesus is going to come and visit us. Get out of the trees. 
And then he spoke the word of Jesus about five or six times. And on the last time he spoke it, he fell off the stage. He got hit first, whack, and landed in the, in the um, congregation audience, in the, in the group. And this young African guy, he was there at the time. And all he can remember is seeing these people falling towards him like dominoes. And him turning around to run. <laughs> and then he woke up <laughs> under a whole bunch of people. And he said the power of God hit the whole place. Across the road, the people who didn't get out of the trees were out of the trees. <laughs> the people sitting on the, on the cafe, around the cafe, were on the ground. This, this man was not an intellect, but there was a depth to him. A depth to him that allowed the Holy Spirit to move powerfully and touch people's lives. So my question is, what of, what of me and you and I? How do we step, and that's why I've called it, let's go deep. How do we step into that depth in our lives? Because I hunger for that, that I would know Jesus more each day. So the types of things, what are some of these spiritual disciplines that we might touch on over the next few weeks? Not sure if I put a slide on this one, but they're things like the inward disciplines, meditation, prayer, fasting, study. They're common things. We've heard them before. Meditation, prayer, fasting and study. They're not, they're not that complex to us. We've, we know about these things. Outward disciplines. Maybe these words we don't talk about quite as often. Simplicity, solitude, submission and service. Some of them we do. And then corporate disciplines, confession, worship, guidance, and celebration. So some of these things are actually regular parts of our everyday lives all the time. We're here today because we're doing some of the corporate disciplines. And we've experienced how it impacts our lives. Let's go to the next slide. A longing for God. Because there's a question about these disciplines. Why do you do them? <laughs> what drives you? Where do they come from? Let's read Psalm 42, 1 to 2. Psalm 42, 1 to 2. I'm going to read it from the Passion Translation. I long to drink of you, O God. Drinking deeply from the streams of pleasure flowing from your presence. My longings overwhelm me for more of you. My soul thirsts, pants, and longs for the living God. I want to come and see the face of God. I think we need to. That, that's a powerful psalm, isn't it? No, when I finished that song, I just felt like we needed some space to think about that. We need to let those words sit in our spirits. I long to drink of you, O oh God. Can you let that sit just for a second? Without it... Without the enemy or the accuser coming and saying, that's not true, you don't. You haven't proven that. The way you live is not like that. Because I don't believe that of us. It is true. There is a longing in our hearts for the living God. <laughs> we do long to see him face to face and be with him in our everyday lives. And sometimes we can actually allow the enemy and even our own voice to tell us something different. But it's not true. The very core of who we are does long. And it's, it's actually just simply, that's the primary requirement for the Christian walk, is that simple longing for God. It's not overly complex. 
we need to sometimes allow that to come to the surface because our lives in our Western world become overly complex <laughs> and busy of many things and, and don't I know about it? Busy full of so many things. And, and that longing, that natural relational longing gets just pushed down and smothered almost. So, so you don't need to be an intellect or a spiritual giant to, to live a life with spiritual discipline in your life. You don't need to be a pastor or a missionary or, a, or even a prayer warrior. Or a, You don't need to be... You can just be an everyday person. There's another quote that I want to read out to you. I think it's on the next slide. You must not be led to believe that the disciplines are only for spiritual giants and hence beyond our reach, or only for contemplatives who devote all their time to prayer and meditation. Far from it. God intends the disciplines of the spiritual life to be for ordinary human beings, people who have jobs, who care for children, who wash dishes and mow lawns. In fact, the disciplines are best exercised in the midst of our relationship with our husbands or wives, our brothers and sisters, our friends and neighbours. So one of the things that often comes up for us when we start looking at this sort of stuff, because I know, because I've been in Christianity for a long time, is I've tried all that stuff. I, I'm not very good at it. I don't get very good results. My discipline is lax. You know, I've, I've tried to get up in the morning and do prayer and I've tried this and I've tried that and it goes for just such a short period of time and then it, I'm off again. I'm back into normal everyday life. And, and what comes is, is guilt and doubt and, and, and you feel like, ah, oh, I'm not able to do this Christian life. So, so the result of that is you go, well, I'll just be a Christian as best as I can. And, and I'll do my best, but I'm not very good at this. And we've all felt that. And, and that's why I wanted to, but, but as this guy is challenging us, he says, these disciplines, they're not just for the experts, for the professionals, for, for those that have made success of their Christian walk. This is something that God has given each one of us so that we can walk with him. I've got here in a lot of cases we do not even know how to step in or what the spiritual disciplines even are. We, there's, we, we look and we say, I long for you, God, and I want you, God. And then we go, but I don't even know how to take the first step towards you. And that is part of what, why we have teachers <laughs> and others around us and the word of God, because he hasn't left us without instruction. There is actually a natural, normal way of living life on this planet that he created. He created this life. He created us. And there is a natural way that he has made for us to walk in that works. And it's not the world's way. It's his way. And that's when, when we say this word spiritual disciplines, that's what I'm starting to see what it means. It's not some super special thing that good Christians do. It's actually us, as God's children, learning how to walk his ways. And he has given us things that enable us to do that. So the spiritual disciplines bring freedom, is my next point. Not slavery, because so often people have felt enslaved by their... You know, I remember when everyone said, you know, Jesus prayed for an hour, right? Or he asked his disciple, he went out and prayed, and he says, couldn't you even pray with me for an hour? And so what, what we do then is we as the church, we grab that and say, you should be able to pray for an hour. Have you prayed for an hour today, Martin? This morning. <laughs> this morning between five and six is the best time. <laughs> but but isn't it, hasn't it been like that? For some of us, we've felt like that. Because we've grabbed a truth. It was a truth. Jesus was feeling it. <laughs> and he said, couldn't you even stand with me for an hour? Like It was like, oh... 
These were his hand-picked guys that then took the church into the rest of the world. But we turned it into a rule and lost the freedom. Yet another quote. Neither should we think of the spiritual disciplines as some dull drudgery aimed at exterminating laughter from the face of the earth. <laughs> Joy is the keynote of all the disciplines. The purpose of the discipline is liberation from the stifling slavery to self-interest and fear. When the inner spirit is liber liberated from all that weighs it down, it can hardly be described as dull drudgery. Singing, dancing, even shouting characterises the disciplines of the spiritual life. Sometimes we have such a picture of the disciplined Christian as the monk up in the top of the hill in this big monastery, beautiful looking old place, but who would want to live there like they sleep on rocks for beds and they, you know, it's just like beautiful gardens often. Don't know what they eat for food, but it's pretty limited. And they sit there all day with their legs crossed or something and they chant and they, some beautiful music's come out of that place too. But none of us want to be them. And we think about that as the ultimate spiritual discipline. But it's not true. It's not what we're talking about. So, I want to talk just for a little while now about what I've titled The Ingrained Nature of Sin. Because we all actually, why do we need spiritual discipline? Why isn't it just natural for us to relate to God? To be with him and walk with him and talk with him and listen to him and, and be obedient to him and do his works? Because we've been created such that that would be natural to us. What's stopping that from happening? Every day. All the time, just naturally. There's some struggle that goes on inside us, isn't it? And we still feel that even though we're totally set free, we still feel this struggle. The ingrained nature of sin. The natural motions of our lives produce mire and dirt. Sin is part of the internal structure of our lives. No special effort is needed to produce it. <laughs> Says, no wonder. We feel trapped. And so many of us do feel trapped even still. Even still there's bits and pieces in our lives that we, have, we feel trapped by. Things that we feel like, this has gone on in my life forever. And I'm not sure if I'll ever get over it. And we feel trapped. By sin. I'm not going to read through all of Romans 3, 19 to 18. But it's a pretty confronting scripture. I'm going to read some bits of it. But the first little bit says, So are we to conclude that we Jews are superior to all others? Certainly not. So Paul in this scripture is addressing the fact that you can start to think that you're righteous because of your position, your status, your, your, you know, what you've got in life. And he goes on and, and quotes, I believe, from, previous, uh, from the Old Testament, but there, there is no one with true spiritual insight and there is no one who seeks after God alone, he says. <laughs> All have deliberately wandered from God's ways. All have become depraved and unfit. Kindness has disappeared from them all. Not even one is good. When you read that, don't you sort of try and excuse yourself from that? Say, surely not. <laughs> it's not. I'm not that bad. Their words release a stench, like the smell of death, foul and filthy. Enjoy some of the modern translations because they use some fairly strong words that get the emotion into it. Deceitful lies roll off their tongues. The venom of a viper drips from their lips. He's talking about the human condition without God. Bitter profanity flows from their mouths, only meant to cut and harm. They are infatuated with violence and murder. They release ruin and misery wherever they go. They never experience the path of peace. That's interesting, isn't it? They shut their eyes to the awe-inspiring God. That's the human condition. That's that ingrained sin. That's where it takes us. There's nothing about it that is good. 
and every evil disaster we've seen on this planet has come out of it. And there's some horrific stuff. Isaiah 57, 20, but those who still reject me are like the restless sea, which is never still, but continually churns up mud and dirt. That's our condition without God. Romans 7, 5 to 6, we're starting to get to the way out. When we were merely living natural lives, the law through defining sin actually awakened sinful desires within us which resulted in bearing the fruit of death. And I think we've seen it in our lives. But now that we've been fully released from the power of the law, we are dead to what once controlled us. And our lives are no longer motivated by the obsolete way of following the written code so that now we may serve God by living in the freshness of a new life. And here's one of the things that we still need to learn more of in the power of of the Holy Spirit. How do we get out of this mess? And Paul talked about it in Romans 7 at the end. How do I get out? It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. But the question still is, well, what do I do? Because that's the Holy Spirit's power that pulls me out, not my power. So why is it, and this is my question, why is it that some of us still struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle and others of us step and step and step and step? We all have stuff to work through, right? Every one of us has stuff every day to work through. Every one of us has decisions to make every day. I know I do. Every one of us, even whilst I was playing the piano, I was working through attitude issues this morning and having to surrender my heart to God. And it wasn't necessarily even me that I was fighting. <laughs> Sometimes it's the enemy that I'm fighting. And he's trying to get a space in my heart. He's trying to get a space in my head. He's trying to take me away from what God's doing and take me to a place where I'm distracted. So I have to have ways of focusing myself on God so I can do what God wants me to do. Every day, every one of us are making decisions, but why is it that some of us seem to struggle around the same thing all the time and others of us continually step and grow? What's the difference? That's my question. And if you feel like you're struggling and stuck, I'd suggest you ask the question because actually you won't hear the answer until you ask the question. I could tell you the answer, but, but you won't hear it until you ask the question. Because that's how we are. And if you're anything like me, you need to hear it from God, the answer. You need to hear it in your spirit. Because then he'll show you how to start walking out and not walking in circles. Because he never leaves you or forsakes you. I get to talk to you every now and again. The next point, willpower doesn't cut it. Willpower doesn't cut it. Colossians 2, 20 to 23. You have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Don't, 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 don't. Don't do this, don't do this. Don't dance. There was a time in the Pentecostal church you weren't allowed to dance. There was a list of don'ts that just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. And that's what the Holy Spirit's talking to us about here. Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. <laughs> These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial and severe bodily discipline. But they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. You know, the, the dance one's a pretty interesting one. I've got two daughters who dance a lot. And, and dance poses challenge. When they dance, you know who they dance with? Guys. And they're both very pretty daughters. And, and when you're dancing close to someone, you connect with them, don't you? 
There's some risk, isn't there? Maybe we should make a rule, don't dance. It happened. We did. The church made a rule. Don't dance. It's too dangerous. We've got to control that. We've got to pull that into line because if we allow that to happen, bad things can happen. Didn't David dance before God like almost naked? That is loincloth on. Isn't there dancing in heaven? Isn't dance part of the expression of who we are in God? Why would we say don't dance? I remember one time here we used dance and I preached to it and it was powerful. I really enjoyed having dance being part of our service to communicate the message of God. It was powerful. Well, they were, these, they were some of the Martin and Carmen's daughters and my daughters who were dancing and Rachel who helped choreographer who's done lots of dancing and it's just like dance is a beautiful thing. Why would we say don't dance? Because we're trying to use our willpower. We're trying to use our control. We're trying to use what we have access to to control the world around us and to get it into order. And Paul says, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. No help at all. You know what happened when the church told people not to dance? They went out in the back alley somewhere else and danced. They went out to the nightclub and danced they, they, because they wanted to dance. So Richard Foster says, willpower will never succeed in dealing with the deeply ingrained habits of sin. And then an interesting one from, not quite sure how you say the first name, Heine or Heaney Arnold. As long as we think we can save ourselves by our own willpower, we will only make the evil in us stronger than ever. What do you think about that? It's an interesting battle, isn't it? I, I've noticed it. When I fight something with myself, the thing I'm fighting becomes more and more dominant in my life. It becomes more and more saturated in my life. And I fight it and I fight it because I know it's wrong and I, I don't want it. And I, I fight it and it's more dominant. It has more power. It gets more influence. So what do we do about this? You, you can see when things are not quite working for you because you can have a look. There's telltale signs. One of the key things is what comes out of your mouth, <laughs> especially when something around you is going out of control, when something around you is not the way you want it, what comes out? Take note. <laughs> Just take note what comes out. If you don't like it, go and have a chat to God about it because you... Willing it to go away is not going to make any difference. It just came out. Because it was in there. <laughs> and maybe sometimes if you're really willing to have a look at the mirror, you can say, whoa, that's pretty disappointing. But if you're willing to bring it to the Father, there's healing. There's an answer. But if pride comes and other stuff comes and you say, no, that was wrong, I'm going to go and repeat a hundred times, you know, and write on a blackboard, whatever it is for you, to your willpower to fix that problem, and I'm going to be better. And you're better for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then, bang, it explodes again. Yes, still in there. Still there. What am I going to do about it? Our actions, not just our words, but our actions, how we act. You know, one of the things that I, I'm tuning into more and more for myself at the moment is if I'm just feeling down a bit, just feeling down a bit, just feeling off a bit, thinking, why, Kim? If you're feeling off now, how's that affecting Heather? <laughs> how's that affecting the kids? Why am I feeling this, like, like this depression, this pressure on me, this, this downness? What is that, Lord? And so I'm just wanting to tune myself to what's going on. What, what's going on in my head? What, what are my thoughts? What are my actions looking like? It, sometimes I'm tired, okay? I'm not trying to overly judge myself here. I just want to be in tune. I, I want to be able to bring it to God. 
And, and I say, yeah, I am pretty tired, but I don't have to have a frown on my face just because I'm tired. I, but I probably do need to allow myself to relax. So I won't try to do 100 things tonight, I'll just relax. And I'll enjoy my family and, and be a blessing to them. And I say, our actions. <laughs> Even the expression on your face, now you don't get to see that much, do you? But others do, those who love you. Last night we were talking to Diella, and I don't know, it's one of the conversations we were talking about. I can't even remember what it was now. And Diella said, look at the expression on Dad's face. Because <laughs> she's looking over Skype at us. I have no idea what expression was on my face, but it was telltale of what I was thinking. And, uh, and, and that is, you know, others often read that about us, don't they? And they then interact with us based on what they're seeing going on. So these are signs that our willpower just can't shut these things down. <laughs> they, they will, the will has no power to hide our inner self. It's incapable of transforming the inner spirit. So the next point is, what's God's answer? What's God's answer to this problem that we have? And it's righteousness. Romans 5.17 For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. So he gives us righteousness. As a, this is his answer. He says, you can't cut it, but I give it to you. I give you righteousness. And then it says, and it's his wonderful gift, of, it's a gracious gift, those who receive it. Because I've still got the question, what's my part? Those who receive it will live in triumph over sin. That's a powerful promise. Those who receive the gift of righteousness will live in triumph over sin. When? That's always my question when I hear that. When, Lord? When? How about right now? If not now, why would it be tomorrow? Are you still having to do something? Do you still have to change something that you can change tomorrow so that you can live in it? Isn't that back to willpower again? So why not right now just receive the gift of righteousness? You can learn to walk in it. That's, that's a different thing. But if you're not righteous today, I'd say to you, you won't be righteous tomorrow unless you make the decision to receive the righteousness today. It won't be through any action that you do. And then you will triumph over sin. So where does this leave us is the next point. I think there's a big quote here. Because some people will then say, and I think that quite covers it. Let's read it. The moment we grasp this breathtaking insight, we are in danger of an error in the opposite direction. We are tempted to believe there is nothing we can do. Because we've come to grips with the fact that we're so hopeless at fixing it ourselves. And then we finally accept Jesus has fixed it all for us. And we go, Phew, nothing I can do about that. Couldn't do anything to fix myself. And so if all human striving ends in moral bankruptcy, and having tried it, we know it is so. <laughs> and if righteousness is a gracious gift from God, as the Bible clearly states, then is it not logical to conclude that we must wait for God to come and transform us? It's just up to him whenever he wants to do it. I don't know, God, you might be a bit busy today if you could fit me in tomorrow or maybe next week or, you know, where am I on your list? So we're waiting. Strangely enough, the answer is no. No. The analysis is correct. Human striving is insufficient and righteousness is a gift from God, but the conclusion is faulty. Happily, there is something we can do. We do not need to be hung on the horns of the dilemma of human, either human works or idleness. God has given us the disciplines of the spiritual life as a means of receiving his grace. The disciplines allow us to place ourselves before God so that he can transform us. 
And I thought that was a beautiful picture. He went on in the book to actually put a picture, paint a picture of like a road on a huge, with huge chasm down each side of the road. And one side is the, one side of the chasm is that human striving to achieve everything and be right. And the other chasm is the just human, just I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> And then he said, the spiritual disciplines help us walk on the road where Jesus is. And we walk with him and it's then Jesus. It's then our Father who transforms us. Not the spiritual disciplines. They, they just keep us on the road <laughs> where the Father transforms us. And I think that's a really, like I've really enjoyed how he put it. I go, yeah, that's freedom for me. I want to walk with Jesus. How about you? <laughs> I want to know him and I want to know him intimately and I want to be pleasing to him. So he's given me a method. He's, he's allowed me to be part of it. He's allowed me to make choices. So our part, train yourselves to be godly. We do have a part to play in this. Train ourselves to be godly. And 1 Timothy 4, I'm, you could read the whole chapter. I've just grabbed highlighted bits and it says, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. <laughs> Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourselves to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better Promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle. Notice they do work hard. <laughs> we do work hard and continue to struggle. For our hope is in the living God who is the saviour of all people and particularly all believers. Teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. Can you hear, as I just sort of picked out bits of Timothy 4 there, the work that actually is involved in living out the righteous life that we've been given? It's always a bit of a funny thing to understand, isn't it? Because there's a tension between these things. You, you could fall over either side of this chasm. You could fall off the road on either side. And maybe some of us do sort of go dangerously close and put one foot almost over the edge every now and again. We have to grab out for Jesus' hand. Say, so save me. Probably for me, it's my own works. Because I'm one of those sort of people. You know, so for me, I, I, I'm walking along and then I, I, I start walking towards the edge of the road that is more and more of me doing it and less and less of him. And, and then my foot goes over the edge and I start to tilt and I have to grab him. He pulls me back on again. And I spend a day or so with him just walking around talking and listening <laughs> instead of doing anything. And he pulls my heart back into centre and, and we get on with the job again. And, and I notice I've done that when I'm starting to get a bit anxious when anxiety and these other things, which the Bible makes quite clear, are not of God. Quite clear. And they come up inside me and I go, whoa, okay. <laughs> I think I'm walking dangerously close to this side of the road. Again. And some of us, it might be different. You, you might actually go towards a, hey, hey I just got to sit back and let it all cruise. And... And, and that might be where you end up, on the other side. But uh, you can see here that we do actually need to train ourselves to live godly lives. It's not just something that we just let happen. But as we do that, the next point is don't turn the spiritual disciplines into laws. Because you'll start to cherish the spiritual disciplines because they give you training, right? It's, it's like people who go to the gym and they love doing the exercise. But if they forget why they were going to the gym, which was maybe just to get fit, to enjoy having a healthy body, 
and they just get totally absorbed in the exercise and get like fanatical about it. You know what actually happens often to those people? They start breaking things. They go to extremes and their muscles go to extremes and they actually wear themselves out doing the exercise. They get absorbed in, in the whole process of doing the gym and they, they forget that they actually just wanted to be healthy. <laughs> and the, the discipline becomes their focus rather than, than actually the result. So don't turn the discipline into laws. If we are to progress in the spiritual walk so that the disciplines are a blessing and not a curse, <laughs> we must come to the place in our lives where we can lay down the everlasting burden of always needing to manage others. <laughs> This drive, more than any single thing, will lead us to turn the spiritual disciplines into laws. I found that a very interesting comment. So many of us, when we start to walk this path, one of the dangers is we start to think, I'm doing okay. I've worked this thing out. I've been walking this for a long time and I know what to do now and you're not doing so good. You could fix over here and over here. <laughs> Actually, why don't I teach you how to do this? And what you've actually done is turned the spiritual discipline that was to bring blessing and freedom into a law that's used to measure and judge somebody else. And in doing so, you turn that law straight back on yourself. Because you will find that if you go there, that you will, you will be the greatest critic of yourself. And you will step out of freedom. And I've seen it so many times. If, if you are judging another by a certain measure, you will judge yourself more harshly by that same measure. And you will not be in freedom. So these, these are not things to cause restriction and judgment. The spiritual disciplines are to bring freedom and release in our lives, to help us to walk on this path with Jesus. And that's my last point, walking with Jesus. He says, we must always remember that the path does not produce the change. It only places us where the change can occur. This is the path of disciplined grace. So Richard Foster is capturing these two words, discipline and grace, and putting them together, saying disciplined grace. The grace is from God <laughs> that changes our lives. The discipline is something that we step into that enables us to be in the place where we're with God, and he changes our lives. It enables us to walk on the path. And as we start to unpack this over the next number of weeks, or it may even be scattered over months with other things in between, I'm not sure, because these are fairly fundamental things and, and we need to think about them and, and churn over them. And as I've been um, thinking about this, I've, I've spent a bit more, because the first chapter is about meditation. And I've been thinking about that more and spending a little bit more time just walking because for me, walking in the bush or walking is a place of meditation for me. And allowing God and just giving him my heart and seeing what comes up and talking to him and focusing my mind on him. And it's been very freeing. It, it helps me centre back on him again. I can see the power in the discipline. But the power in the discipline is Jesus. <laughs> That's the power. It's the Holy Spirit, not the discipline itself. It, it's, there are many that meditate. Meditation has become an Eastern religion type of word. It's in the Bible heaps. <laughs> it is a Christian word, meditation. We just got to understand what Christian meditation actually is. And it's not the emptying of your whole thoughts and your whole life and to try to go into some place <laughs> or non place. It's actually the coming into God. It's the focusing on Him. And you can meditate through nature and through uh, just sitting and talking and through stillness and quietness. And you can meditate on His Word. There's, there's all sorts of ways, and we'll talk about it. 
but it is a spiritual discipline that brings you closer. So let's read 1 John 2, 5 to 6 as we finish. But the love of God will be perfected within the one who obeys God's word. We can be sure that we've truly come to live in intimacy with God, not just by saying, I am intimate with God, but by walking in the footsteps of Jesus. So I'm looking forward to this next season as we think about walking in Jesus' footsteps. I'm really looking forward to it because I think Jesus walks quite differently than the world around us. I really do. He proved it when he walked on the planet for the 33 years that he was here, that he walked quite differently. Actually, no one actually really understood him. Not one. Like even at the end, when he was about to die, his disciples, his closest, most intimate friends, still didn't quite capture his walk. It's pretty telltale, isn't it? But he walked differently. And we are to walk in his footsteps. And we can do it now through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Oh Lord, I thank you for the beautiful life that you've given us and the opportunity that you've given us to live it. Jesus, it's your life, your life that you've put in us. You are the life and everything was created through you and for you and you've given us this opportunity to live, to be alive and to walk and to learn your ways. So Lord, I pray for your blessing over each one of us. We have a journey with you, a journey to step into more and more of you, to know your ways, to enjoy your ways, to follow your footsteps. Lord, I ask that over this next period of time that you will unlock those, we call them secrets, but Lord, you've written them for us to read. <laughs> we just know that we need you, Holy Spirit, to reveal them to us that they would become living and active in our lives, that we would have an experiential knowledge and understanding that comes from experience about how it is to walk with you and to live out a life of spiritual discipline where there's great freedom and joy, where there's dancing and singing, where there's peace, where there's hope, where there's a future. So Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you that you lead us and you guide us. And you know, if there's people here at the moment that feel like, man, I'd like to be able to walk with Jesus, but I don't even know who he is. <laughs> I've heard about him. <laughs> I've heard his name in all sorts of places. But I don't even know who he is. He comes to you. He knocks on the door. He says, I come and I knock on the door. Will you open the door? I've come to have a meal with you. Will, will you sit down with me and have a meal? Could we have a chat? I'd like to tell you how I see you. I'd like to hear what you have to say. No, it's just a simple step to open a door. You get up from where you are, you walk across, and you open the door. And you say, come in. I still don't really know who you are, but I think I'd like to have you in my house. I'd like to get to know you. I'd like you, actually, to sit at my table and eat food with me. I'd like to come to know you, Jesus. If you're in that place, <coughs> respond to him. I'd encourage you, respond to him and say yes. And if you'd like one of us to pray with you, if you'd like me to pray with you, then come to me afterwards and talk to me about it. And we'll pray together. But he loves you, and he cares for you. Amen.